So I guess I guess I kind of speak on like why why anarchism 101 and why we're going to even have like the conversation. Part of it is I think it's come up in a lot of different conversations in terms of I think what a lot of the things that the Occupy movement is doing um, is organizing under you know either its processes or just organizing as a group and using kind of anarchist principles of organization, which is um, you know participatory general assembly consensus process. Um, I'm sorry. In non uh, yeah, definitely no leaders, no representatives, all parties out. Um, mutual aid to where you know when, when you, if you go if you go to get like you know uh, when we had when we had a health tent down here or when we had like when we had a food tent down here, it wasn't a uh, wasn't part of some market that we were trying to create where we were trying to charge money and things like that. So it was all people just kind of contributing and trying to make the movement what it is. And to me, that to me that's very uh, anarchist in orientation. Um, and so that's kind of part of one of the reasons why I wanted to have the discussion. The other one is to kind of like you know what do you mean by that? I think there's a lot of like popular misconceptions. There's ones that come up on the internet all the time of like, well, anarchy's just chaos. You know. I mean, to me, I don't, I don't, I don't. Think that that's it at all? I mean, anarchy, like most uh, simply defined, is just being without leaders. Um, you know, with you know, that's what anarchy means, really, literally, is without leadership. Um, and so then the question then becomes: I think people's question is like, then, well, if you don't have leaders, then how do you organize? You know, or if there's no leaders to organize things, if there's no representatives, then. You know, are people just going to kind of run around and do whatever they want? You know, to me, that's just kind of like having a lack of... Uh, to me, that's just kind of a cynical position and having a complete lack of trust in people. So and I think I think part of that lack of trust in people is the fact that, number one, people don't understand, like, what it is to build a community. I think part of part of being down here in this space together, sharing the space, figuring out what our, our conflicts are, you know, figuring out how to build habits of um, relying on each other, I mean, to me, that's um, going against that kind of typical, typical understanding that, like, well, if you don't have leaders, if you don't have representatives, and you don't have these like really rigid hierarchical structures in place, then things are just going to fall apart and everybody's just going to die, or people are just going to start eating each other or something like that. Um, so I think that why I think it's really important to have a discussion down here because I think that part of part of what Occupy movement is doing is, is kind of doing that, you know, building a different set of habits about, you know, participating together as a group of people. Um, so, I mean, it's just in the beginning stages, but I think it's, it's something that's kind of important to me from, from my experiences down here. Um, so that's just kind of like a general kind of, I don't know, getting thought about like why I wanted to have the conversation. Um, but further than that, in the sense that, well, I, don't, I also have a lot of critiques. I also have a lot of, you know, ways in which I, as an anarchist, you know, want to push things further. But I mean, I can just offer those critiques and participate in my own way. I can't just, you know, come through with the steam, steamroller like, you know, typical party, party hacks and, and things like that do. I have to participate in the process to get to know, and, and it's a learning process for everybody. Um, but one of the things that I think is important is to think about anarchism in terms of um, what critiques of the current crisis, uh, for me, can only anarchists um, offer that I think remains unavailable to a lot of other political beliefs and political positions. Um, for me, I think the most obvious one is talking about, when we talk about like the, let's get money out of politics. I don't know at what time money hasn't been in politics. Um, especially, I don't, I don't know what time money hasn't been with the state. I don't, I don't know what time we point back to. Uh, we were having this conversation earlier with uh, the Students for Liberty uh, Libertarian group that were here talking earlier. Um, so it's a matter of not just being like, oh, okay, well, the economy's shitty and we're in the economic crisis right now, but is it just a matter of getting the state out of the way or is is there a certain kind of are the state and capitalism kind of like bedfellows and they're always going to be that way so for me as an anarchist and a 
it's a matter of like pointing that out to where it's like, okay, well we can talk about going back to Glass Steagall, you know, we can talk about the gold standard, we can talk about getting rid of the Fed, but you know, we can go back to those times in history and shit sucked back then too. The state was doing all sorts of the state and capitalism together were doing all sorts of things that were, you know, nobody would uh, agree or it is anything close to a just society. Um, if anything, it was even worse. And so, so part of that too, part of the extending the, the criticism of the current situation, the current economic crisis, not just to, you know, this terms of like crony capitalism as if there's a good capitalism, um, is kind of keep extending at, keep pushing the critique further to where, you know, you push the critique onto the state too, you wrap those up together. You push the critique onto uh, different forms of privilege, uh, whether we're talking about uh, patriarchy, whether we're talking about uh, white privilege. Uh, so if we keep pushing that critique further and further to see, you know, why we have people that are excluded from uh, excluded from the system kind of overall. And so for me, it's a matter of attacking kind of privilege, attacking systems of privilege, kind of and making privilege like uncomfortable. And kind of for me, what that means is it's like, when we're talking about not having any leaders, usually a leader is there because they've been, uh, they've established some sort of privilege um, as a person. And typically throughout history, that means either like by aligning themselves in some sort of uh, religious sense, saying I'm the only one that has access to the divine, give reverence to me um, in the sense of uh, in any sort of like monarchy and stuff like that you know these are people that through their bloodline itself you know that, that's the reason why there are leaders uh, we have you know some of our more current ones in terms of we have uh, you know representative we have people that usually we're like oh well we give those people kind of like credit because they're maybe they went to school and they got an education and uh, so we should kind of pay reverence to them, you know, because like they're, they somehow know something, they've gained a certain kind of knowledge or something like that. So for me, it's a matter of, or it's just by virtue of like, oh, that that's a uh, white male, for instance, you know, should, should I hold any sort of like special privilege? But I mean, it's like, I can't deny that I do as a, as a white male in, in this society have to hold certain sort of privileges. And so it's a matter of like trying to smash those down. I associate myself as a race trick, you know, openly because it's like I think it's it's a matter of like recognizing the history of which we're a part of. So not only the colonial history, uh, you know, histories of slavery within the country. So I mean, it's a matter of recognizing all of those systems of privilege that are put in place that work in you know coordination between the economy, the state, um, to create the system that we have now. So it's a matter of like you know. Okay, yeah, let's let's do something to fix the economy. Let's get money out of politics. Great, it's a good starting point. But it's like you're going to see that you know, you're not going to get to where you want to go. Means. Can you say race trick? Is the idea that you're trying to like actually feel how brown people are not trying to in this country? Oh no, no. I, mean, I think that, I think that that's like a, to me that's almost like uh, insulting. To, to be like, oh, well, I'm trying to feel the oppression of people that I, I could never be, you know, historically. So, for me, it's just a matter of saying that, like, I'm going to do everything that I can to resist systems of, like, white privilege um, and to resist or to make visible. Um, I think that Joel Olson has a really nice piece on it. He was down here uh, a week or two ago talking about uh, white privilege and white color blindness to where it's like, we don't recognize that as part of the system of privilege, then you're making some mistakes. If you don't recognize what other communities that might not be here right now, if you don't recognize their historical oppressions, then you're, you're missing out on, on connections for the movement as a well. whole. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what I mean about that. I mean, it's not, I don't think that's specifically uh, necessarily like an anarchist position, but I think it's, it's something that I don't know any anarchists who would be have problems with that position. Um, and for real, I mean, I guess mainly it's a matter of like trying to build a habit of like 
how do we build a certain kind of habit of being ungovernable by like some sort of like outside structures? I, I mean, we talk about everybody says like, oh, I love freedom and I love liberty and let's go. What is that? I only have one quote. It comes from Janis Joplin. Freedom is nothing but another word for nothing left to lose. Yep. That's a good point. I mean, true it's like, anarchy, true freedom is based in not being controlled by anything. Absolutely. I don't need your 9 to 5 job because I don't need your fucking apartment. <laughs> I know how to use a tent and rope in a fucking tree. I can live outside. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that brings up like a really good point to where it's, it's like, to where systems of privilege can be like the system of like, you know, where it is that we choose to live, what kind of luxuries and leisure leisure activities we participate in. So there's all sorts of things that can be called into question um, in terms of like, if we all wanted to like, agree to like live that way, you know, or how would we all, how would we all build in certain habits to where we could live that way? Um, we think of our country as being civilized, but people don't understand that there's still a lot of wild land in our country. Places like, uh, I was talking yesterday about uh, BLM land in New Mexico. It's the Bureau of Land Management. This is land that you can literally go put a shed out in the desert by a fucking water source somewhere and stay there indefinitely. Off, completely off the grid. Um, there are four or five different states that have such a low population. New Mexico, Arizona, Wyoming, Montana, Alaska. These are all states that you can go to and, and live completely off the grid. Oh no, I can, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. But at the same time, it's like, as, and I think that that's one path to, to being ungovernable, to, to like moving outside, moving outside. In order for anarchy to work on a large scale, it has to start on a small scale. Oh no, I, no, I, no, I completely, I'm not talking, I'm nothing, I'm, I'm not talking large scale at all. I mean, that's like, we, I don't want that at all. And I think that brings up um, a good point about, in terms of like thinking about scale of governance to where, you know, if, if we want, if we want to live on a smaller scale or if we want to, if we want a fully just society on what scale can we then talk, start talking about government? I mean, it's a, it's a matter of like, for me, it's a matter of like looking at like what specific scale. So like, let's take, let's take Occupy Phoenix as an example. So we as a group are trying to get together here and figure out um, a different way to participate, a different way to like resist injustices in our society together as a group without it, without appealing to some sort of outside political parties, without trying to get representation, you know, without trying to like, you know, um, you know, trying to get like some sort of Occupy party, you know, or something like that, that was gonna get votes as like a third party or something ridiculous like that to where we wanna be done with all of that. And to me, to me that's what that's what anarchism is as a system is it's like being done with all of that and recognizing that that through like different things like uh, participatory uh, democracy, mutual aid, helping each other out. Um, through those kinds of different forms of organization, we can figure out how to do things differently. I don't know what that looks like, you know, fully in practice, because it's like, we can't just go, I mean, we can just go, some of us could just go off to those side areas, but for me, what's important as an anarchist is looking at like what surrounds me right now and seeing in what ways do those things that surround me right now stop us from doing that. Stop, yes. What, in what ways do those things stop us from being free as a, as a group of people? To where it's not just one of us, not just one of us going off, but all of us doing something together. It takes nothing more but the will. In all honesty, people and uh, people I've talked to recently have admitted that, yeah, I, I, I like having my stuff. Which I understand. I myself am, am a minimalist, but what stuff I have? like my stuff you know what I mean I understand the liking of stuff but it's the subconscious need to have stuff which makes us gut-wrenchingly capitalist by nature you know we're, we're brought up to believe like I gotta have the shoes I gotta have the clothes I gotta have the TV this that the other fucking thing uh, subconsciously most people can't get over the idea of why would I not want these things? 
Why would I not want them? I think I think the point that you're making it is a good one. I think on selective individual levels, we might be able to come to that consciousness, but without something like well, most without people something. Don't understand that you can't in fact live without I know these that. things. But I guess what I'm saying is that if, if I'm not going to be a totalitarian dictator and tell everybody that they need to live that way, then how do we organize? How do we create a different kind of space that we're, where we participate in, to where those ideas can come out? in a way that's not coercive. I'm not saying that everybody has to live this way. As a matter of fact, it wouldn't work if all of us did. Because, uh, for example, I showed up in Phoenix last night because yesterday morning I got pulled off from my freight train and I, I in Gila Bend, I was on my way to Tucson and I wasn't even coming to Occupy Phoenix. I, I found you guys by accident. But I've been traveling from Occupy to Occupy and I found my way here, I met some cool kids, and I got lucky. Last night I got to go with laundry, take a shower, which are things that everybody's like, I do that shit every day. And to me, those things are luxuries. Because I put myself in a situation, I, I put myself without those. See, I couldn't live my life without people who live inside, who, who do the, you know, who do do these things. Well, I, think, I mean, that, I guess that, that's that's like a really you bring up. That's a really good point. That's kind of like why for me, like I can't be, I can't consider myself. And I'm just speaking for myself. I can't consider myself like an isolationist, for instance, in that sense, because there is a sense into where whether we're using social media, whether we're using systems of transportation, whether we're using any of those things, we are relying upon some sort of social infrastructure. To me, it's just I want that social infrastructure to have nothing to do with capitalism nothing to do with, right. with the state. Okay. You know. Do you mind if I read something? Sure. I wrote this as a generic description, in my opinion, of what anarchy is and how it relates to the Occupy movement. It is in no way meant to be specific because there are so many factions of anarchism and there are so many different beliefs. We could be here for days talking about it. But I'm just going to read my speech and I hopefully, hopefully my message is construed. Anyways. It's titled, My View on Anarchy and How It Relates to the Occupy Movement. Anarchy is one of the most misunderstood political philosophies on the face of the planet. It has been, unfortunately, associated with the idea of pure chaos and disorder. This idea was created by opposing political powers, much the way communism and socialism are the boogeymen of the United States, and alternatively, alternatively democracy is China's theoretical demon. Anarchy is derived from the Greek word anarchosis, or anarchos, meaning without rulers. Anarchy is typically meant to refer to a society which lacks publicly recognized government or violently enforced political authority. That is quite generic in my opinion and quite honestly harbors the notion that anarchy would mean chaos and lawlessness. Nothing could be further from the truth. Outside of the U.S. and by most self-identified anarchists, it implies a system of governance, mostly theoretical at a nation-state level, although there are a few successful historical principles, or historical examples, that goes to lengths to avoid use of coercion, violence, force, and authority while still producing a productive and desirable society. Does that really sound like the monster our political masters have had us grow up to fear? Or does that sound like the type of system that a, that a ruling elite may violently oppose? I'll let you decide. Historical examples were the territory known today as the Ukraine during the Russian Civil War, much of Spain in 1936, and Somalia between 1991 and 2006. Anarchy is generally defined politically as a philosophy which holds the state to be immoral, and alternatively as opposing authority in the conduct of human relations. Proponents of anarchism, anarchists, advocate stateless society based on non-hierarchical voluntary associations. There are as many flavors of anarchy as there are ice cream, or perhaps democracy. I don't believe any advocate blowing stuff up, killing your neighbor, or widespread rape, although I have been known to be wrong from time to time. I see many good tenants of every faction of anarchy I research. Few are perfect, but nothing is. Capitalism certainly hasn't turned out to be the panacea they promised, has it? 
I most closely relate to libertarian socialism, also known as social anarchism or left libertarianism. Ironically, the term libertarianism has been used as, as a synonym for anarchism and was used almost exclusively in this sense until the 1950s in the U.S. It is still used as a synonym outside this country. Libertarians in the U.S. are essentially referring to the free market only. They've basically twisted a good thing. They advocate government in some areas, just don't interfere with the corporations. Libertarian socialism, on the other hand, is a group of political philosophies that promote a non-hierarchical, non-bureaucratic, stateless society without private property and the means of mass production. One thing that I think connects most anarchists is that we are all optimists at heart. We may have no faith in government and authority, but we have the utmost faith in people. People inherently know what is right, well, most people. We inherently know that we all have basic human rights. We know war is wrong, murder is wrong, violence is wrong, thievery is wrong. People always point fingers at anarchists as if we are historically associated with these things. That is foolish. I don't think anarchists are the ones who deceived an entire nation into believing that a small group of fundamentalists hijacked commercial airplanes, blew them into the World Trade Center and Pentagon, when there is compelling evidence to suggest that that's not exactly the whole truth. I don't think anarchists then used said terrorist act to start their own never-ending or well inspired war on terror. I don't think anarchists then invaded a completely unconnected country that had weapons of mass destruction, which all experts and UN inspectors told us was not true, simply so they could secure said country's mass oil reserves. No, I'm pretty sure that wasn't anarchists. I can't imagine anyone despicable and corrupt enough to do something like that. My point is, maybe we shouldn't trust violent governments like China, the former Soviet Union, and honestly, our own, when they preach the dangers of anarchy. They aren't exactly credible. Most anarchists are so opposed to violence that they assert that even having authority over another and the very act of control is, in itself, a form of violence. I'm sorry, but I don't see how we are the threat. I completely understand how people are uncomfortable with the idea of anarchy, though. We have grown up hearing that propaganda, and that it is a very hard thing to overcome. I understand that it takes courage to overcome years of programming, but I believe people are naturally courageous. Our minds are stronger than they would have us believe. The 1% know this especially well. They purposefully confuse everything and try to make it seem like every issue is more complicated than it is. Don't let them make you feel stupid. Too often we feel that way, afraid to ask questions, like somehow we should know something, no matter how absurd the idea seems. They rely on them. Trust your instincts. We all have a built-in morality, and I for one don't need any god or government to tell me what to believe and what is right. I'm not trying to force anyone into believing that anarchy is right. That is a personal choice, like religion. I'm trying to advocate for our human rights. Don't discriminate us against us because of our political affiliation. Talk to us. Debate us. But please, don't dismiss us. Thank you. That puts it really well, I think. Um, and I think it echoes a few things that I said in the opening part, too. So um, I think the most fruitful thing that comes from any sort of discussion is having other people participate. So um, I'd love to hear questions. I'd love to hear kind of worries about things. Um, I had some. Uh, not contentions, but I think, I think, I think opening up a discussion with regards to the discussion of violence, um, just because it's something that I've been having discussions about within Occupy, um, but I, I'd like to hear kind of people's ideas. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, there's two things that I kind of, when I think about why I'm an anarchist and how I feel about anarchism, you know, obviously we can go and we can talk about the historical nature of anarchism and how it's been a serious movement century now, all around the world, you know, we talk about that, but there's two things that I always think about, you know, and the, the first one is, the society that we live in now, 
the basis of our society is built off of fear, and, and the, the, the laws are built off of ignorance and fear and, 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 and anger, you know? So, you know, I think about this, and, and, I, and I think, well, to me, all anarchism is is just completely reversing, reversing that, and starting off with the fundamental idea of freedom, and then building from there. So every piece of human relations is now based off of something completely different than it is now. And that's kind of how I feel, feel about anarchism. And some people say, well, you know, this might not, might not ever happen in our lifetime. Or maybe it's a great ideal, but, you know, who knows how long it's going to take. Well, you know, the, the, way I, the way I think about it in that perspective is, why the hell wouldn't we be anarchists? You know what I mean? I mean, what's the other option to be, a, you know, to work for the Democratic Party, to be a liberal and send an email, you know what I mean? Like, we can do, we can fight for all the things that we want to fight for. You know, and still be an anarchist. You know, why fight for all the things we want to fight for, but just you know be a Democrat instead? You know what I mean? Let's think about it. Let's take it all the way and let's make it go all the way instead of just kind of like pigeonholing. You know what I mean? That's how I feel about it. See, like when I first got here or whatever, you know, I heard the title anarchist, so I was like, all right, what the fuck is that? And so everybody's like, oh, they worship the devil. They do this. <laughs> <laughs> they do that. And so. Um, you know, I, you know, just basically everything in the book. And so, you know, as time went on, you know, I, I saw it was good anarchist, bad anarchist, but he's quiet. Like, he really is. I've This is the longest I've ever heard him talk. <laughs> like, literally. I'm, I barely hear him, but still. Like, he's a good guy. Well, good man. And I still don't believe he's an anarchist. That's, that's just how cool he is. So, like, with me, I'm starting to learn a little bit more and more, but then, at the same time, girl, please, this is my moment, okay? I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just playing, but yeah, we do have good people, then we have Neville, he's an anarchist himself. <laughs> Neville! He that, he's that fat cop over there. <laughs> but yeah, he's an anarchist himself. And he a little evil little piggy. But you know, honestly, I think if you know if you guys weren't here, everybody would be like, all right, well, let's kick all the anarchists out. Because when I first came, I was like, all right, I'm down. Because you know, everybody told me that you guys worship the devil, and that kind of freaks black people out. <laughs> That's why you only see two black guys here. Our systems reflect the idea that our community is based off of uh, fear of individuals and of groups because our laws are made to say that you can't do this because you might possibly hurt someone even though you're doing your own individual kind of thing, like smoking pot or something is a good example, right? Uh, but I think what's important about that is that, you know, at the beginning of the Constitution, for example, we had these ideas of like freedom, but how did our practices? really follow those ideals. And I think a lot of what anarchism is for me is having our practices follow our ideals. So if I really believe in freedom and that everybody should have an opportunity to do whatever it is that makes them happy in life, then I want to create a system that will allow for that to happen. And I think that is very much what anarchism tries to do on a small level. Uh, I wanted to hear you talk some more about like fanaticalism. I know Tyburn talks about that a lot. Oh, okay. We talk about it as well. I think it's something people here don't know a lot about or to misinterpret it. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think fanaticism, to boil it down to like a really quick thing, is basically to say there's uh, there's always going to be. I don't care what society is. Why I don't believe in utopia. There's always going to be. Pe there's always going to be dissent within a group, there's always going to be reactionaries that are trying to move against what it, what it is that you're trying to establish as far as a just society. You can't get rid of those. So in terms of fanaticism, it's always recognizing that those are going to, so there's always going to be these like reaction, right-wing reactionaries. There's always going to be these, and sometimes there's left-wing reactionaries, like Lenin, for instance. Um, so there's always going to be like these reactionaries, and you can't do away with that. And there's always going to be the people that are fanatics, who associate themselves as fanatics and stand on against that completely, to where there's no middle ground, there's no compromise, they're like, we want, to where it's basically like, I mean, the way that he talks about it is, he says like, rather than put out like a set of demands for reform, he says, why don't we just demand that the whole system be done away with? So the point is not to say like, 
not to put forth like an un, an impossible goal, but to say like, here's our position. We're gonna we're gonna stand by it, and the whole point of it is to try to capture that middle ground to our swaying back and forth to where it's like the majority of people are not ardent right-wing reactionaries but they might be swayed they might have they might be completely complacent and so those are all the people that by you taking a hardline stance against all of those things you say i'm not willing to compromise on racist practices of the state i'm not willing to compromise on imperialism i'm not willing to compromise on colonialism i'm not willing to compromise on any of these things so here's my stand right now it's either you give me this and that's all i'm going to do you know so for me it's a matter of like taking that position not being afraid to take that position on the opposite side and draw the line in the sand saying either you're with them or you're complicit with what they're doing or you're over here and you're fighting for a better society that's i think that's what is meant by fanaticism yeah he also talks sometimes about like uh like when he sees a situation that's wrong like instead of being complacent or just being like that sucks like really highlighting that situation and like instead of being embarrassed by it right. like really really bringing it to people's attention and not trying to hide from it because he's white and uncomfortable with it Absolutely. Yeah. Like a lot with racism and Absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's definitely it's putting oneself in situations to where you're you're forcing yourself to be in an uncomfortable situation to critique your own, you know, systems of privilege that you might partake in. Yeah, definitely. Um I saw John. So and I think you brought up the word anarchy and why people are really confused about that, and I think you brought it up over there too. Uh, when you first got here, uh, you, know, you didn't know what an anarchist was, they thought it was something crazy. Well, there's actually a specific reason for that, and it's a specific historical reason. In most of the world, if you go outside of the United States, people generally know what anarchists are and anarchism, they have a you know, basic idea of it, whether it's popular at the time or not. But there's a very specific reason why people started to think of this, the word anarchy, as something that's very dangerous. And the reason why is when from 1880, the beginning of the, the first wave of the anarchist movement worldwide, from 1880 to about 19, the beginning of World War II, and the anarchist movement worldwide was crushed wherever it turned out. Like governments, whether they be communist governments or you know the American government, everywhere, like murders and, and put, you know people were in, put in jail until the movement was essentially decimated by the 1950s. I mean, in the in the, in the 1950s in America, you'd be hard pressed to find an anarchist. So before you know before the you know the college or the anti-war stuff, right before you know beginning of the 1960s, there wasn't really any anarchist groups that even existed in the United States in any sort of serious form. So you're talking about 1950 to now, there's been so much government propaganda of what anarchism was and what it did. If you read the history books, you know, it says that anarchists were bomb throwers, that was it. Of course, yes, anarchists threw bombs, a lot of people threw bombs back in those days, you know. But, but they have now defined the history since there is no brand, there, there was an anarchist movement. You went back to the 19-teens, 1920s, and you asked the worker, the workers knew exactly what anarchism was, and the state knew exactly what it was, you know. It's much different now, and that's one of the things we work against pretty much consistently. In Chris's speech, he mentioned the Orwellian War, and uh, Trustee said that they control us with fear. I think our government actually found a wonderful way to control us with both fear and pleasure, kind of mixing Huxley's um, Brave New World in. You know, you get your tax return from the government, you love that, but then later, holy shit, I got a DUI, now I fear the government, and you know, you know, you know what I'm saying, I just think it's important to touch on that. So I am pretty wholly uninterested in talking about uh, violence in general, but I do think that this raises, since other people are talking about it, uh, and, and I'm interested in it because I think it's a it's a distraction from why we're why we're out here. I think it's very clear who's been violent since the day we've gotten here, and that's the police. Yeah, the police. Uh, and so one of the things that anarchists do is we question a lot. We question authority. That's like a big bumper sticker. Um, <laughs> And, and one of the questions is, uh, who's violent here? And, and you know, you can just hear that, yeah. It's the cops. We know who's been pepper spraying. We know who's been beating people up. It's pretty obvious. Whether or not violence or nonviolence is correct or right, I'm uninterested in that conversation because I don't, yeah, we can have that another time. But one of the things that I think is really valuable, um, an anarchist critique, um, and one of the ideas is critiquing the state as having a monopoly on violence as saying, oh, the only people who are legitimately allowed to use violence with absolutely no question in our society is the state, uh, and 
security forces run by corporations. Um, and we see that all the time in the news, and it's just reported on as just fact, like, oh yes, and then, you know, these 20 people were killed in Iraq, and huh, no big deal. There's no investigation, there's no one to like, was that okay, what's the reason before that? And the same thing in the United States, I think, to some degree, when, when people are killed by police, there's uh, a much lesser degree of investigation into the wrong, the, whether that was a correct or right thing to do. Um, oftentimes I would say no. I would say that I don't believe that the government should be able to kill people um, or have a monopoly on violence or what it's more effectively doing these days, which is just the small little bits. It's not that they're going to come and assassinate you in your bed like Fred, Hip Fred Hampton. They're just going to pepper spray you every time you show up to make an issue about something. They're going to pepper spray you at first Friday so everybody has to run away. They're going to release a sound cannon so everybody runs away. They have to, there's some new thing today, there's a, a light a light cannon they're going to start using against us. I mean, it's like, it just goes, yeah, and it blinds you. It just goes on and on and on, all the little things um, that they do to disrupt discourse and disrupt people. Yeah, they're people who are such a, yeah, they're sure. nonviolent, right. So critiquing that monopoly of violence they have. Along with that, I think goes another analysis um, that I don't have a cute phrase for, like the monopoly of violence, but looking <laughs> at the state as the gang that it is. And so, so when in popular media you can read about like all the gang wars in the 90s, there's the Bloods and the Crips and they have this like, they, they're working on uh, making money through drugs and prostitution and then violence comes from that. Uh, and so you can look at that as a little bit of an analysis of how corporations use violence to protect their uh, money and their wealth. Uh, and when we start using the analogies and, and, and also just like, Critiquing that as immoral as the other thing, and saying it's not any more legitimate for Blackwater Corporation to hire uh, security forces and uh, kill people and abuse people and torture people at whim. The same thing is true for the organized state, uh, which essentially is the gang for corporations in this country, um, and it was the gang for capitalism prior to that and for slaveholders prior to that. Um, so uh, to me, the thing that's really interesting about anarchism and about Occupy movement is, I think within the occupations across the country, there's been a real criticism around um, the excess power that corporations wield. And I think anarchism provides a really nice um, framework for seeing how that works and a framework for decrying the, the illegitimacy of the uh, corporate power structure, just as somebody might decry the illegitimacy of like a gang power structure in LA or something. I'm done. So kind of kind of piggybacking on that and I apologize because I don't want to talk about nonviolence as like a general thing but um, so at Alec um, I feel like I'm in this place where I'm trying to regroup and reorganize around my understanding of assertive organization um, and assertive organization as it is done by the people um, because the Black Bloc at ALEC was one of my first real um, sort of participations in and around um, a really well organized, really assertive group of people who were willing to take whatever was given to them by the police. Um, and that it's, it's starting to really change my understanding and my dialogue of what violence is and what nonviolence is. And not that we necessarily need to talk about it today, but I feel like I need some way of sort of framing that um, that can help move me forward in my understanding and my education because I had an immense feeling of camaraderie and um, empowerment and just this amazingly new feeling that I hadn't really had before being part of that. So um, I don't know if you can speak on that or if that's something that, that we can talk about after. Yeah, I, th I think actually on Tuesday down uh, Tuesday down here at 7 o'clock, um, myself um, and Nick, who puts on uh, some of yeah. the nonviolence workshops, we're going to have a panel discussion about that because we've each done our own kind of teach it workshops separately. Um, commenting on our own positions on with regards to that. So we're going to have a panel discussion on Tuesday evening to, to have that discussion. So, uh, what's that? Seven, I think. Seven-ish. Um, 
But yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think it's really important to, uh, just kind of, I think Kate's point that she made is to, before we have that discussion about what's violent and what's non-violent, it's like recognizing the objective violence that is already in place right now, yes. historically up to this time, right now. And so when we talk about, when we start nitpicking about little things, it, it's like you just completely, you're completely avoiding the whole violence that allows things to be as they are right now. So I, mean, and that, I think that's kind of Kate's, Kate's point. For example, someone gets punched outside of a jail. Which is more violent? The entire power structure of a jail that allows communicable diseases to be spread, people to be killed, the mass rape that goes inside prisons and jails, which people are very uncomfortable talking about all the mass rape that happens in prisons and jails in this country because it's about male-on-male -male sexual violence. People are uncomfortable talking about that, but it's a fact. And, and the system that allows that sort of violence to maintain and go on and separating people from their families all the while, we're worried about someone getting punched outside. That, I, th I think that that's an example. Yeah, and I, I think, and I think when you bring the critique to that level, and when you make that, and that's part of, and that's part of what anarchism is important for me, as a physician and, and as a political belief. And it's like it's important because when you take the critique to that level, it's like how can you accept reform of a prison system? You know, it's like. I don't want a prison system. It's just this, it's not only because it's being put into private hands now, but because like that structurally produces like not only like, you know, massive inequalities for people of color, but also creates all of that violence and perpetuates all of that violence of the system and people's inability to like get by. And it's just a completely like, it's pointing out completely alienating institutions. I think that's part of like the power. I guess this is a good place for my question. As a non-anarchist, um, I guess I always wonder what would the anarchist answer to personal property and personal rights be? I mean, like uh, our minimalist even said, he's like, I don't have much shit, but what I have is mine. And I guess what would the answer be to protecting people's personal rights if you're not going to have some sort of law enforcement structure or any sort of coercive... <coughs> yeah, I mean, is it just going to be up to the individual? Um, you know, well, I, I guess. The, the, the question was... Um, how how are you going to have private property? How are you going to have are you going to have private property or property or how personal property? How are you going to have I mean, how are you going to have personal shit. items in a society to where it's like we're not going to um, just be in a you know free for all kind of you know oh I like that stuff I'm going to go take it to where right. I think that that I think that part of that part of that worry comes out of is I think a, a very normal worry because. Why are we worried about people stealing our stuff? Probably because there's a whole bunch of people that are have been either not not been able to get any stuff for like the longest period of time, whether that's food, whether that's shelter, whether that's like basic clothing goods, and they're not allowed to get that stuff because they're completely uh, alienated and oppressed and um, cut out of the system entirely from like receiving those things. So we have absolutely no habits of sharing, recognizing that this is, that's yours, I'm fine with that, kind of thing, to where I think that it's just that our set of habits about, that's something that I think we need to build, I don't think that's something we can guarantee, I don't think that's something anybody can guarantee, but it's like, if I choose to live with a group of people, participate with a group of people that appreciate that, can we build that set of habits together, then I think that I'm less worried about something going missing, and if something does go missing, is that person going to be kicked out, yeah, locked well, up, or is that person, or is that person going to be kind of called out within the group, you know, kind of thing? And, and, and are we going to imagine justice operating in a different way as opposed to like that retribution, revenge kind of thing that we have? So you know, and it's kind of that, I guess, issue of scale again. Because yeah, maybe if you know the fifty of us agree that yes, that's how we're going to live. I mean, how do you scale that up to like? society, to the I state, think, to the country. I've got a whole bunch of hands here that I know. probably help answer, but I think my quick... I want to know. Yeah, my, my quick response would be, like, you have to create those habits. We've created habits of selfishness on a global scale. That just that didn't just come about overnight, you know? That came about through years and years of dispossession, theft, uh, imperialism, colonialism. I mean, you, I mean, that's like hundreds and hundreds of years of creating a set of habits 
that are associated around like the virtue of selfishness. To quote uh, that asshole, Milton Friedman. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, th th that's something that you create. Like you create those kind of habits, and, and like to to imagine something. Like we're on such a small scale right now because we have to. But it's you know the Occupy movements, and you know we have all these examples of people trying to imagine and build habits for something differently. And that's like how I, but I'll, I'll stop talking and let it burn. Say, here. say you raise stuff. pigs and I grow <laughs> corn, right? And your pig farm is next to my corn farm, so we do business, you know, because I like pork and pigs like corn. Now, some guy who's bigger and badder than you shows up. It was like, you know what? I'm gonna take all your pigs. And you're like, I can't really stop you. That's where solidarity comes in. That's where the people around you come in and say, excuse me? No, this is part of us. You don't mess with us. You know, not 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 attacking, not anything, but just, you know, it, it's I'm just the way I believe anarchy should work is like, I may not agree with his religion, his political belief, his anything. I may not even like the guy. But if I see somebody oppressing him, my job, my 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 duty as 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 somebody who believes in my personal freedom is to step up for his. Um, so that that's how anarchists would take care of you know personal things. Somebody steals from you, and and we catch him. It's like no, you give that back and leave. Now you're no longer welcome in our group. That's On the other just, hand, to avoid creating a group that would be big enough monopolize on the weakness of others, we wouldn't allow there to be formalization of large corporations with well, well, sorry, even with even basic breaking it down to base human nature, there's always gonna be that one, excuse my language, that one asshole who's gonna be like, you know what, I am bigger and stronger and I'm going to take what I want. There's always gonna be that guy. There's always gonna be that guy who collects other guys like him who are just a little bit weaker than him. So now you got roving gangs of fucktards that are running around raping and pillaging. And that's when that's when people who are actually interested in the community, people who, though I myself am somewhat of an isolationist and only joined the Occupy movement because I realized that not enough people are, you know? But like, even I will step up and be like, no, this is wrong, you should, this shouldn't go down. That's how anarchists take care of justice, by stepping up and standing together. I, I think you're wrong. I think our system necessitates the big jerk who gets a bunch of other big jerks to go bother people. I think like he was talking about how... Go back to Attila the Hun. I think he was saying the same thing. Go back to Attila the Hun. Go back to the tribal societies, man. Even then, there was that yeah, one I know, a -hole. Is, I think it's been just a stuff. Conditioning of people forever to try to That's because it's base human nature. Base human nature. Human nature. Maybe it's not. Like the government necessitates itself. Fair they enough. No, I, I fully agree with that. You know I mean? But government is nothing more than a symptom of the base human nature. It is I, not I, a I government, mean, it is not a philosophy to change, it is okay, ourselves. I think, well, I think I think what I think the concession is, I think what he was saying, what I heard him saying, to kind of like draw like the, the kind of what you're both saying is basically that like it's unavoidable whether we think it's whether we think it comes from human nature or whether we think it's produced. It's unavoidable that they're gonna be people out there that are going to be greedy jerks. It's it's unavoidable and it, they might be really strong and they might be able to like, do something about it. it's unavoidable that those people are gonna exist. They, especially in a society where you disagree with repressive state apparatus to try and control those people. You know, to where it's like, those people are always going to exist, I think. I just wanted to go back to uh, what you were talking about with uh, possessions. I think a lot of it is something we need to change within each of ourselves. Uh, of course, I've been living this way <laughs> most of my life, but, but we have to get rid of the fear and just be willing to walk into neighborhoods that maybe other people be afraid of. Live life not worrying so much about, you know, who's going to break into your house and steal your things. If, if you can change yourself from within, and if each of us can change ourselves from within, the society changes. I understand we can't change other people, but we've been programmed all of our lives to be afraid, lock our doors, don't go into certain neighborhoods, don't go out by yourself at night. I understand there's always going to be crime, but you travel to a new city, what do they do? If you check into a hotel, they warn you, don't go into these neighborhoods, don't go, you know. 
And I understand, there's legitimate reasons to be afraid, but we have to change within ourselves and get rid of the paradigms that we've been programmed into and, and just, you know, live. There's been a lot of talk, like what he just said about, you know, how it really does take this, it's actually a pretty simple shift sometimes to kind of sometimes just realize, wait a minute, I'm not going to just go break into my neighbor's house no, no matter what system I'm living under, you know what I mean? Like, generally, you know? It's not going to happen, and if it does happen, there has to be justice. And anarchists don't, don't anarchists believe in justice, you know? We, you know, we believe in protecting our community. You know, whatever that, whatever the ways that we may do that, you know, once there's a you know, more free society, and there's a ton of ways, you know? So that's a kind of important way to think about it, but specifically your question, more technical answer, I think, you know, as anti-capitalists, you know, we, and this is more of like an anti-capitalist uh, ideal, but uh, there's a difference between personal property and private property. Private property, private property is, you know, a factory that has, that's owned by, a, you know, a capitalist and then you have workers working for them. Personal property is, you know, my toothbrush or my spoon, you know what I mean? Those are the kind of things that a community will protect and will always protect, you know what I mean? There's no reason not to. I mean, you know, do you see what I mean? Or my yeah. car, or, uh, I guess know. I'm just, I'm not someone that draws a distinction between the two. I think if... I mean, whatever your arguments with capitalism may or may not be, if something is yours, if you own it, uh, whether you've managed to own a whole factory or just your backpack full of crap, I mean, it is yours. The distinction between personal property and private property, I guess I don't make that distinction. I mean, whether you agree with how someone acquired that factory or not, it's theirs as much as, you know, their toothbrush is theirs. So, 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 yeah, there, there's, there's a problem that we have, I have it with it at least. Um, if you own a factory, and you're producing profit with that factory, then that is going to naturally create a, a, a wealth, a concentration of wealth, and that's going to create power within society and you're able to protect that wealth. And going along with that, you're going to want to create more wealth. So what you're going to do with that factory is you're going to pay your workers less, and you're going to, they're going to live in shittier conditions, because that's how you make profit in that sort of society. That's unavoidable. There's no way to get past that. So as anarchists, we don't believe in that kind of private property because we know what it leads to every single time for the past 150 years. So that, that's why we think that. I mean, you can think whatever no, you like. No, that's fine. That's but I, I mean, that's, that's why. Yeah. That's the beauty of anarchy. You're welcome to believe whatever you want. Getting back to your like question on like a practical level. Oh, that video's going to be so hard to watch. You'd be all, zoom! <laughs> <laughs> okay, but anyways, on a practical level, to answer your question, you think about... Um, like, what happens if your spoon gets stolen? I mean, like, the police are never going to get your spoon back, right? Like, spoon. Right, yeah. I'm just saying, like, for the vast majority no, of things... I actually have one. It's been so fun about it. You have a spoon. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. Uh, but, like, the vast majority of things, we don't call the police when they get lost because you know they're never going to get it back. Some of us don't call the police because we also have an ethical, like, stance against using the state for that purpose, uh, being <laughs> complicit with the state in that way. Um, but I do think your question raises like, an, you know, an important practical questions, you know, like, I have a foofy phone and it's expensive and I've lost it twice already since I've had it in the past year and both times people just like gave it back to me. I mean, it wasn't, and I think that uh, remembering that while some people are very greedy right now, um, there are a lot more people out there who are kind and will give you your things back. Um, and I think what we have right now is a system where we have a gang that's representing the most greediest of people and no one to stand up for everybody else. Um, and, and then that gang is sold as like this kind group that's going to help you out and help stop you from being raped and helps keep you safe and help uh, get your belongings back when in actuality it perpetuates a system of violence that encourages all of those things, like encourages the maldistribution of resources so that some people have lots and lots and lots of other people have not enough. Um, but I do think like the question of what happens if your bike, like I'd be real mad if my bike got stolen and yeah, I, I lent my bike to somebody last year and, and my other bike and, and they got it stolen. I was, I'm still mad because <laughs> I don't have my bike. And, and like, I don't use the police, so what am I going to do about my bike getting stolen? And, but those things, I think, are a lot better facilitated by lost and found type systems than by relying on the police, because they don't really actually give us our stuff back. No. So, or all the things they stole from Occupy Beach. <laughs> 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 um, it's totally oh, it's totally true.
what she said, I, uh, there was like a group of like 10, 14 year olds went through my parking lot one night and just kicked my motorcycle over and did like $500 worth of damage to it. I called the cops and they got there like an hour and 45 minutes afterwards and then wanted to know what I wanted them to do about it. And I was just like, are you fucking serious? Just like leave and I'm going to bed. Why did I call you? You know, but it, if I do something wrong, they're right there, you know, to get me. But um, to the whole... Um, like, we keep talking about this, like, personal property and stuff, and, like, I, I think it's interesting as Americans, because we're in this, like, hugely consumer-based state of mind right now, or just inundated with images of, like, you need this, you need this, you need this, so when it comes up as a topic of, like, you know, what about my personal property? How important is that personal property, and is it just feel important to you because these are the images you've been told that you need your whole life? You know, how well, much... there wouldn't be that lack of like right now there's such a different there's a, a huge gap in like the haves and the have-nots and the have-nots are stealing because they have not you know and in a community people would provide for their family for their friends for those who function in this community and wouldn't feel the need to steal they could just simply say hey I don't have a spoon can I borrow yours or on a higher scale and I don't know I keep forgetting all my other points I wanted to say, I don't mean to shout you out, so I know what you do for a living. Is it cool if I say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so you're a midwife, and you have to have, like, a fingerprint card for that, right? Oh, yeah. I have so, lots of documentation. Yeah. So, like, how do you feel about working with the state that way, being an anarchist? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, change the topic. <laughs> I got my toes. <laughs> like it. I think to a lot of degrees, we are forced to engage with the state on um, people of varying, I mean, everybody who has a legal job right now has to be complicit with the state on some level. You have to turn in a, a, an ID and have a social security card and or a social security number, or a tax ID number and, and be complicit on that level. Uh, I have chosen to be more complicit um, with the state by, by engaging, it's called nurse midwifery, is the kind of midwife I am. Um, and that's very much within um, uh, more Western medicine. And so Western medicine is greatly controlled in the United States um, by the state. Um, I've chosen to interact in that level because it allows me access to people um, and patients of a more diverse patient background. If I was to do CPM, which is Certified Professional Midwife, they're also um, regulated by the state, but they are, uh, they're less so, um, but I would have a much smaller patient population. So I, I don't. It, it just as a decision I made. So I mean, we're all. I mean, we're all complicit. You know, we all have to. We all drive on the roads and follow the. You know, follow the laws and have to get driver's licenses. And, but some saying, people don't. I really respect them. But you're making the decision of like how many people you can help versus how complicit you have to be in the state, and you can help helping the people. A little bit numbers wise but a lot of it more has to do with patient population and that if I was to be a certified professional this is so detailed I'm sorry if this is way no, off topic okay if I was to do that type of midwifery like if I was to be an herbalist or a massage therapist it would be very much people who would pay out of pocket and that would that would rein in the people I would be able to work with to be like upper middle class almost all white women um, and people could who could pay out of pocket in order for me to make a living currently the kind of midwife I am, I can be reimbursed by both insurance and access and different things like that. So people who have, I mean, one of the few remaining types of public health care we still have is uh, prenatal care. Um, and so because of that reason, I'm able to work with people who wouldn't, who wouldn't otherwise be able to have a midwife. Yeah, like I agree with you guys <laughs> with the bikes is, you know, there's, I, I'm going to say about five or six bikes I have to I had to chase after and um, I mean I used to love track in high school and all but <laughs> I'm not in high school anymore so yeah that's something you guys should talk about during GA because <laughs> I'm not gonna run next time so something belonging to you is, is completely different not just in theory of like what private property is but in practice of what private property is. Private property requires a massive state to be there, whether it's police, military, to protect.
protect those private property rights. And yes. What you're saying, think about what would happen if you threw a brick through a Wells Fargo window. Think about what would happen if I threw a brick through your window. The police would not care about your window. You bet your ass they're going to find them through that brick through the Wells Fargo window. Well, and, and more so, and I, it's, a, it's such a great point, you know, because you may not, might not make the distinction between personal credit, but the state definitely does, you know what I mean? You know, the state is the one that's going to be there, that's breaking breaking strikes, you know, that's making people get to work, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, that's breaking up meetings, that's infiltrating groups that are, that's trying to undermine that value, those values, you know, that's what the state's doing, you know, not going to go, you know, they, they might be able to find, you know, who knocked over your bike, you know, but like, you know, it, it, they might be able to do that better than they did, but they're really damn good at protecting factories and protecting work, you know. So they make the distinction. Back to the issue of uh, how we all have to work within the state's methods and laws in some way or another. Is anybody familiar with uh, uh, emancipating yourself and becoming your own sovereign nation? <laughs> uh, it actually is a fairly popular underground thing, especially among libertarians and uh, I, don't know, I would I would like somebody to speak who knows more about it than I do. So um, if anybody, if that's actually you want to hear about that, all you have to do is go to the county where you were born, <coughs> turn in your social security card and your birth certificate, renounce your U.S. citizenship, and you become what's called a sovereign citizen. Um, you no longer get to get any benefits from whatever you're not getting benefits from, anyways. But uh. You get to do whatever the fuck you want. I mean, you still get arrested. You still get taken to jail. You're still, you're more or less a U.S. citizen with even less rights. But it, it allows you to walk into another country, any country in the world, and seek political asylum. Like, if I were to walk to Costa Rica, which, quite frankly, I'm too lazy to do. I might take a freight train, though. Uh, I could go to Costa Rica or Canada, except not Canada, because they don't like me. Uh, <laughs> I can go to like Costa Rica and I can seek political asylum because I'm a man with no country living in a country that is oppressing me. So the only thing you have to do is renounce your citizenship and you can become a sovereign citizen of the world. Do you still, if you're a sovereign citizen, um, do you still have the same rights as regular U.S. citizens? Oh God, no. So you don't have first yeah, I mean, no social no. security. I have no social security. Like, Though I, I have a, a state-issued ID, like, I'm a, I, I got that solely for the benefit of, uh, well, I mean, it's from Iowa. I, I, I could have given them, I could have said Joe Wolf from Pokemon and they would have fucking uh, But the fact is, is I, I carry an ID because it expedites matters when they're fucking harassing me because without ID and the fact that I'm not a U.S. citizen, they can arrest me. Be subject to like, and, and, indefinite and, detention. Yeah, they can put me 40 miles off fucking shore in, in international waters and like five ships they can bring to prisons. And they can hold me there indefinitely. What they're trying to do to you guys anyway, they can already do to you. Like, that's the game of our
they went through like a totally different process of deliberating how to deal with the kind of puzzle of eating tape. Uh, so I think there's, there's different ways other than like the men who are having professional police force and having professional military. Um, I know that having like, you know, How do we sort out differences? I mean, I think families, uh, as a, take a family unit for itself, you know, how, do, how does a family sort out differences within itself? Some of them are you know, much more severe than others. Um, I guess I just think that there's, there's alternate ways that we'd have to try and like, figure out as a group how we're going to sort out the differences. And I would hope that it would be not divesting that, divesting that authority that, that should be partially yours and shared with them other people to like a specific group of people. I think that's part of like professionalization of other people. child and we decide to get divorced and we're fighting over who gets the kid, the community should be like, all right, well, you know, she's got the, the house and the, 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 the whatever work that provides for everything and he's, he, he, he's a, a transient farm worker. We leave the kid with her. You know? Exactly. The, the adage that it takes a village to raise a child is absolutely true. My humble. Just really quickly, I, I think what what you're saying actually, I think you you might be still be thinking of anarchism maybe in the wrong way, kind of, because um, what I hear you saying is like, well, how how, how are you gonna you know solve disputes? You know, essentially, you know, I don't know if the divorce thing is the best example, but there's probably a billion examples out there. But you know, what what's so incredibly important to understand is that it, it, anarchists believe in organization, just on just. Organization it takes as much hierarchy and authority out of the decision-making process as possible. We know that the, the authorities exist. We know the hierarchy exists. It always will, you know. But we take that out. So you know, an anarchist society is organized so that you know you, you can solve those kind of disputes. There's no question about that. And there's ways to do that. And no, it, people that are smart, you know, an anarchist. I mean, and you know, there's some great interviews. I was just watching some really cool interviews with like. Uh, Anarchists in the Spanish Revolution and Civil War, they talked about this kind of stuff and, you know, kind of what they did. But nobody's naive, you know what I mean? There's, a, there, you know, in, in any bad situation like that, there's going to be a winner and a loser, sometimes unfortunately, you know? But you have to have a society that can manage that in a better way than we have now. And that's really what this important is trying to do. And what we're talking about when we talk about justice. I think that brings up like a really good point. So where it's like, if, you're, if we're trying to resolve like a private dispute, there's a reason why it's like private and secluded. Because it's like maybe it's an interpersonal thing. But if like if we have a different connection to our community as a whole, like you know we share our family time with our neighbors, we share our family time with like different people in our community, to where they have a better sense of us, other than like the wall that's separating our houses, you know, to where they have a better sense of us, then they're gonna probably be able to make. Decisions about or give us good advice or you know to where it's like I think when we break down those like very physical like walls then imagining what how we resolve private situations looks a lot different like I, I mean like the comment about like it takes a village to raise a child I mean it's, I, I, I don't know I I stand behind that because it's like you know it's like parents might think they raise their child but children by themselves it's might be getting a little bit off the point but it, but they don't it means that the child's really they go to school, they go to like this institution, they go to that institution. So it's like when you create different institutions, then how we solve problems, then how we solve problems. I just wanted to say on the subject of um, about divorce as a concept, that's just another thing that was created by men and marriage and a whole bunch of other things that necessitate themselves. So like, yeah, it's 
Well, even that though, like, if two adults can't reasonably discuss that, like, come on. If we're, re we're, we're meant to believe that we can't do these things I say. I'm trying. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I actually do know. So, I mean, I haven't heard much about anarchy, but based going by this particular paper, it seems to me that you could define the Bill of Rights um, in the context of the time as an anarchist document. If you mean, uh, oh, if you're saying, oh, does it mean no government, no hierarchy, or no authority? But it means relative as little coercion as involved as possible. You could, you could make that argument sensibly. Um, and I would also say that uh, that anyone who even tried to go in that direction would depend even more on, as Jefferson put it, a well-educated population. I don't think you could just take a society where 90% of the population can't read and try to do this. Uh, I'll respond directly to that, because I think that um, Number one, I don't. Number one, I've learned more from people, as someone who's pursuing his PhD, I've learned more from people who have never been in school than people who have been in school. Um, and so for, it's fine to create like some sort of document that rewards you all sorts of things. And in, in theory, perhaps we can accept that there's a, a profound libertarian strain within the American Constitution. It's a profound one, but, but, as an anarchist, as a materialist, I can't, I can't take some abstract document and pretend that it's not associated with a specific history. So life, liberty, the pursuit of Happy. happiness. No, it's the pursuit of property. They, they change it on purpose. I know they change it on purpose because they couldn't, because as a group, they're not revolutionary enough to say that like, oh, we shouldn't enslave a mass <coughs> population. So to me, that's problematic. And so I don't want to pursue property. I don't, I don't think that should be I think they change, number one, I think they change it on purpose. And number two, I mean, I would say if you look at it in the context of an 18th century, I would say, you know, that was a profoundly libertarian document. Well, except for the fact that they still have slaves. I mean, well, yeah, the society, I agree. Well, I know, but, but I mean, the, I'm talking there, about the document. There were, there, were, there were white abolitionists. I mean, it's not, it's not just that, that there was some, like, disease in the mind of, like, white people that stopped them from, like, getting rid of slaves. It was like you know, they were they were holding them for I'm not speaking to the society at that time, just the document and the ideas yeah, yeah, yeah. more well, than no, the Bill of Rights. No, I, that's, that's why I recognize the, the profound libertarian strain within it, but there there's a problem with the property part of it, which is like our number one value as Americans. Private property. Can I, can I respond? Um, yes. Okay, great. Great. And I think too it kind of goes back to what um, some of us were talking about before, the idea of having ideals or principles and practices so like i think this is a great example the ideal that the founding fathers uh had was freedom and equality but were their practices matching those ideals not necessarily right depends on which one well, they were quite a women so, well and yeah, women too yeah right and so so the, it's 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 important the difference between <laughs> between i think like the, the the document the bill of rights and whatnot and kind of what anarchists or myself as an anarchist might be trying to do is that we want to put the ideas of freedom and equality and all these other things into practice and we recognize that the system that was created wasn't uh, living up to its ideals so to speak. To speak on that directly, because he wrote, he wrote, the book. He wrote it, specifically the Bill of Rights and our Constitution as an idea, like you were saying, it is a libertarian view. Where it goes wrong is it's not an organic document. Now, for true anarchy to actually happen, it's been theorized by many people, and I personally agree with that. We need to apply it to the situation that we actually exist in now. Now, how can a document that was written 230, roughly 230 years ago, pertain to the reality that we exist in now? I think it can, to a large degree, greater than we give it credit for. I, I personally don't believe that. I think we need to change with the times. I'm not saying that all of those ideals are wrong, but how can you write something expecting the world will never change? Our situation will never change, therefore these rules will always apply to us. And the way that, that the specific Constitution and the Bill of Rights differs from anarchy is because they do set up state institutions. That's the big difference. Anarchists do not believe 
the state institution. But it does say a system of governments in this document. Oh yes, a system of governments that's controlled directly by the people, not an elected group of representatives who can be corrupted. Well, then if the, the representatives aren't going to be elected, what would be the better way of selecting people to do kind of the mundane, day-to-day -day aspects? And, you know, if they're not going to be aristocrats in some sense, they probably would have to be paid in some way or another, just just to do certain jobs and, well, we're too many cooks because it's well, I understand. Do you bring up that distinction? Okay. I was going to say, you bring up a good point, but it's like, do we, do we, do you think that a, a professional politician has a, has a specific division of labor in, in our society should be paid any more than somebody who collects drugs? Well, as far as how much it should be paid, that's definitely an interesting question. But Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote about democracy in America, said, when public servants are no longer paid, therein lies a road to aristocracy. In other words, if they're not paid, you know, if, unless there is some means for them to make a living and to, um, and to deal with sort of the demands of that nature, you know, if we didn't have a situation where they were paid somehow, in some way, only rich people would run and it would, there wouldn't be any chances for somebody from a working class background or someone who was not already independently wealthy to even consider it. Well, no, I understand that. I'm saying that, like, I'm saying that, like, do you, do you think, this is a real straightforward practical question, do you think that someone who's a professional politician, that someone who's, whose job it is to figure out legislation, balance out, work in different committees with other people, should be paid more than someone who uh, collects trash or anything? Should they be paid more or not? I mean, it's like, do, do, we, do we privilege that kind of form of, of... I think to some extent you have to, because it's a hard job. And I'm not trying to devalue the person who collects trash. Well, I mean, but that's, 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 that's the problem, though. There's the problem right there. It's the fact that, like, somebody's going to sit back in the chair, like an aristocrat, and do this, sometimes with the whip, and go, you know, get to work. And then, and to, to me, personally... Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's that easy. I think people... <laughs> so, I'll, I'll get back on something. When was the Constitution written? 1787. It's damn near 
have a really hard time, I think, looking beyond the American ideal because it's been framed in this way that it's the only, the best thing that we can have. I never actually said we were the best country on earth. I'm not, I'm not saying that you are. I'm just speaking generally of this idea that uh, that it is, is in America. And I'm not necessarily directly speaking directly to you just on some of the ideas that I've heard um, coming around from everywhere here. Um, but that it's, it's, you know, if the best that we can do is a system that, you know, relies on stealing land from people so that some group of people can live better than the people that they kick off that land, then I think that that's kind of, you know, problematic. And I think that we definitely can, as a society, come to a more, more realistic and real understanding of what freedom is and not trying to dictate to other people where they can live, what they can be, how they should be paid, all these different things. 